Welcome everyone. We'd like to go ahead and get started today. So um, let me just introduce, I'm Rebecca Deutscher. I'm a senior research associate with CESA um, and I'm part of the research hub. And today we are um, welcoming and Tara Garcia is gonna talk a little, do a talk that he presented, I guess this is a modification from what you presented at AERA. Yeah. So, um, which um, we're really excited that you're here and presenting to us today and we look forward. Great, thank you. Thank you. Rebecca, before I tell starts, I'm yeah. gonna just brag on him a little uh, bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Tara got an award at AERA and this talk was part of accepting that award and the talk was so compelling to numerous people from Stanford and oh, others, but Stanford in particular who were there, they essentially begged me to host this talk. So, <laughs> yeah, yes. so we feel very honored that you are yeah. willing to do this for us and Tara. Thank you, yeah. thanks for that, I appreciate it. Uh, so a couple of comments about this talk. Uh, so I'm going, it's it's a very kind of boring, well hopefully it's not super boring, but I'm gonna do the boring <laughs> delivery of like, I'm gonna read a talk for about 30-ish minutes. And then uh, I'd originally baked in some like pausing points for us to like do some writing, but I think I'm gonna put all that at the end. I wanna have some synthesis time at the end. So my plan is, I uh, apologize, I will talk at you for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have a good chunk of time hopefully to do, um, I'm gonna say 35 minutes so I can remember. Uh, so about 35 minutes, and then we'll have some time for uh, some reflection and some writing stuff together. And so thanks, and thanks for letting me do a talk again all the way. Prince said it better. Um, but I'm going to begin today's talk with the opening invocation of the Prince hit, Let's Go Crazy, to act as a guide for how we interpret both the in-the-moment context of situated performance and research, as well as how such contexts change over time. Prince's opening words recited over the joyous chords of a church organ speak to the thrilling possibility that spills across the squelches, yelps, and funk captured in the four minutes and 40 seconds of Let's Go Crazy. However, more than three years after the unexpected death of Prince on April 21st, 2016, half a year before Trump would be elected, this opening also feels transformed from the authorial intent in which it was first articulated. The context of production and consumption shift over time, and the salvo of this earworm can unite and sting and keep you. Our research in context of formal and informal learning and in places that restrict and free up the bodies of young people is entrenched both in a continually moving present and built on top of existing legacies that guide how and where such work is enacted. Just as Let's Go Crazy is of a particular moment and part of a larger statement of work, Purple Rain, Purple Rain remains a quintessential statement of 1980s Western pop culture. Our research is defined by who constructs this work and what kinds of contexts and through what kinds of platforms. Uh, as my friend Thomas Phillip and I wrote recently, the vast majority of educational and particularly classroom specific research is conducted now without acknowledging the socio-political context that press on the lives of youth today. As students sit in schools within the US, they are presented with reminders that youth are presently in cages, are victims of violence and unnamed deaths, and are foisted into debates of sexual assault and cancel culture. Uh, as, I unpack the, as I unpack the context of our research in the remainder of this talk, I echo a question asked later in the song, Let's Go Crazy. What's it all for? More specifically, articulating the layers of research and examining pathways towards reimagined methods for our present moment, I'm grounding the following questions for our field to consider. What is left unexplored vis-a-vis -vis our current methodological practices? What knowledge from our past must we re-invoke and re-interrogate? <clears throat> and what is the impact of our work? What's the what's it all for? Uh, as my mentor, Ernest Morell, regularly reminds me when we go to conferences, uh, when we share our work and when we publish our works for the small audiences of academia, we must start, ask ourselves who will benefit from the dollars and the posters and the APA citations invoked during conferences and through dissertations. When we go to conferences, who benefits as we descend on unceded land for a few days? How will our time help historically marginalized youth get free? My own research has centered three intersecting areas of inquiry. Uh, which as I go for reappointment is useful for me to try to remember that. <laughs> uh, those three things are technology, literacy, and civics. Uh, specifically, this is scholarship that is about the embodiment of electric word life. And building on this, I want to return to the song, Let's Go Crazy, to discuss the three layers of methodology that I'm going to argue we're going to need to collectively attend to in the work that we do. Uh, 
Uh, the three layers I'm going to dig into here are researcher and identity, the audience and the environment in which we do our work, and the platform and the medium. Uh, as a caveat, I'm making an argument about methodology and responsibility in the remainder of this talk for the next 20-ish minutes. Uh, I'm going to do so through sharing some personal examples from my own research. And it's not because I think I have it right, but it's because these are the places that have led me to ask the questions I'm asking. Um, so if these aren't uh, exemplars, they're things for us to push on and prod on um, together. Uh, if you're interested in any of the articles, uh, I, I blog about them just so that someone can read them possibly, um, or, or I tweet about them as well, you know, questions there. Uh, I also designed the remainder of this talk to dig into these three areas. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to share the places where I thought we would pause and talk, but I'll save it at the end so you can, you can bookmark those if you're interested. Okay. Uh, so the first layer I'm going to dig into is the platform and the medium. So not until February 2017, months after he had passed away, was much of the musical catalog of Prince easily streamable via online services like Apple Music and Spotify. Rather, in order to legally consume the opening number of Purple Rain, Let's Go Crazy, audiences needed to obtain a version as was first available since 1984, a copy of a vinyl record, a cassette, or a CD. It was the acquisition of physical copies of Purple Rain that led to the album's lasting legacy and status as a platinum certified record 13 times over, with more than 22 million sales to date. Though today's listener can quickly swipe and search and stream the entire album from anywhere on the planet, Purple Rain, like nearly every non-live musical experience, used to be consumed in specific environments and in fixed locations equipped with the proper technologies. What may, what may initially seem like an MP3 version of the song is nearly identical to other formats, imperfections in digital audio like MP3s was discernible as part of a significant effort in writing and revising the code for the new digital format. Jonathan Stern in the monograph MP3, The Meaning of a Format, explained, even though listeners may find them hard to consciously detect, subtle yet audi audible differences between MP3 and CD quality audio have become an important part of mediatic sound culture. As we consider the constraints of digital, I think we should think intentionally and invoke the language of analog in the work that we do. Zoom in close enough with a microscope, microscope and you'll see that a vinyl record is a series of canyons and valleys and pathways through which a record needle winds its way on its journey to deliver pre-recorded audio to you. This is an analog journey in which a preserved statement, a record, is recreated. Digital is discrete. It's about the finite measurements. Looks like analog from far away, but up close are singular steps or iterations from one output to another over time. Analog measurements and scales are fluid. Uh, there are infinite measurements between a zero and a one. In contrast, digital measurements have discrete scales of difference. There are finite degrees between one digital measurement and another. An analog metronome swings lazily back and forth. An infinity is held between each swing. In contrast, a digital stopwatch has specific degrees to which to measure differences. There's no measurable midway point between a one and a zero on a digital device. And so this makes me think about the kinds of platforms on which we understand this work. So like songs like Let's Go Crazy, writing, learning, and play are enacted across and for specific platforms. Twitter is a platform, uh, and it's one that is currently considering the nature of speech and who is heard and silenced and verified and amplified and banned. And these are questions that are specific to a publicly traded company, and the values of this platform differ, differ from those of writing, discourse, and learning in other kinds of spaces and other kinds of platforms. Schools also are platforms on which learning and writing, digital and otherwise, are enacted. Over time, these platforms become invisible, so the taken for granted of the literal bells and architecture and expected socialization of schooling that we often see as US public schools are overlooked uh, as dimensions of what these platforms can, can convey, right? What are the things that are useful and they need to be treated? Uh, so one example of where I've been trying to think about this work uh, is in a recent study for, of uh, three English classrooms. Uh, so my co-authors and I uh, were looking at the ways that, that teachers and students were talking about technology uh, and what the meaning of technology was in their classrooms. Um, the, the gist of this was that uh, as much as the students were in one-to-one -one spaces, uh, were regularly using their phones for everything, right, and were also using Chromebooks to turn in their work, right, 
the actual role of all that technology was largely invisible, and they didn't see that work. <coughs> the technology and platforms that mediated classroom instruction were invisible uh, for both the teachers and the students within this project, right? So how did technology become rendered invisible within the platforms of schooling was the question that we were thinking about. Uh, in this very short excerpt, uh, Josh is comparing his teacher to a robot, which we'll come back in a second um, as another thing of, to say that all of our teachers are like robots, and we can kind of see that kind of playful engagement around robots and technology. Uh, as we analyze how students define technology and how these interpretations of technology guided their practices and identities within and outside of school, we found that students in this project primarily referred to technology through language that indicated feelings. I feel, I believe, I don't think. Uh, and then we were able to collapse those codes into three key themes, right? That, that technology is invisible, uh, that technology is connected to humanity, and that's related to society and the power, right? And so we kind of get the feeling of what does technology mean when we ask kids specifically about it within these spaces that are very connected to a lot of other kinds of resources and tools. These school-based contexts for discussion distant students from the assumption about technology from both the use of digital tools in classrooms and from the civic world beyond schools. Jimmy, reflecting on a project that was a part of this unit, said, I learned a lot of stuff during this project, but nothing that I'm really gonna use in my lifetime, because I don't wanna do something that uses a lot of technology. You don't really have that, you don't have to type a lot and stuff because I'm not good at that. Uh, I just wanna note that Jimmy wanted to be an airline pilot, and so it's interesting to think about not wanting to use a lot of technology uh, <laughs> and the work that he's doing. Um, as we're thinking about Bowie in the context of all of this also, right? So when you think about the various layers of what does technology mean, who do we assume it's for, and how do schools reshape what those assumptions about technology might be? Uh, as part of the coding that I shared a couple slides back, we saw this telos-like, this other, other, like the word telos, not the organization telos. <laughs> we saw this telos-like the depictions of futuristic technology reflect manifestations of whiteness and perfection. As one group wrote in a slide uh, for a museum exhibit, it's kind of hard to see here, the robots are white, which is usually associated with a divine being like God, and the concept of a robot that is perfect is scary, then we are making something better than we are. And so there's always this idea of technology is moving us towards something that's perfect, and that perfectness is oftentimes tied to whiteness within the kinds of uh, activities that teachers were designing for. And looking at how technology was invisible within this study and with how curricular structures propelled seeking toward future visions of technology, we must question what contexts are rendered invisible or visible in the platforms of our research. Uh, but that was one teacher, and that was three years ago, or that was three teachers three years ago on one platform of schooling uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and so this would be a place where I, we would pause, but we're not going to pause, so I'm just gonna note this as a metacognitive moment. Um, where this is a question I would, I, I'm hoping you'll be thinking about for your own work uh, for the second part of this talk. Uh, what, what are the contexts of the platforms that you're doing work in, and what's rendered visible and invisible in where you do your work? Those are questions for, um, for us to think about. We would do like the, the writing project approach is only a bit quieter, it's just too quiet in here. Like, so <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna shift over to audience and environment. Uh, Prince did not perform in a bubble. His music was of and for a culture he had helped shape and which his life was immersed. Culturally, historically, socially, and politically, we can locate where and when Prince's work was constructed. We can likewise recognize where and when educational research is enacted. Let's Go Crazy is of a particular time and place. It's depicted in Purple Rain as enacted in the First Avenue nightclub in Minneapolis in forms as informed by 1980s pop culture. It is performed by a racially diverse band. These de details both explain and contextualize the world, environment, and audience that engage with Purple Rain as a text. These facets of how place, time, and identity are entwined shape the ways we read and experience Let's Go Crazy and the rest of Purple Rain. It is, for example, built on Western music tropes. To hear the song today, we must acknowledge the roots of rock and roll, funk, gospel, and blues that inform the spiritual tones and rhythms of the song. We must feel and know that rock and roll is part of a tradition that can be traced back to musical traditions of jazz and blues invented by black musicians coursing through the same violent veins of the slave trade on which the US social cultural landscape is profiting. So, a flashback. So a year ago, uh, I came back from AERA, I guess a year and a, and a month ago, a year and a month and a half ago, uh, I came back from AERA, um, and everyone does that thing where like, you turn on your phone, you, you switch your phone from airplane mode to not airplane mode, to regular mode. Uh, and 
I got more notifications than I typically do when that happens. Usually you get like a bunch of like spammy email and people who want responses and ignore them for a little bit. Um, and, and, but I got a lot of responses and they're all generally kind of angry responses of, and I couldn't quite understand like what was happening um, and why I was getting like grumpy emails and lots and lots of grumpy emails uh, at the same time. Uh, and it wasn't until I did some digging as I was like waiting for my luggage because I checked the bag. Uh, for what is never a good idea, don't do that. Uh, and so I was trying to figure like, what happened? Why am I getting all of these really grumpy messages? And it was, it was once I got uh, home, uh, I found out that uh, Breitbart had written up uh, their interpretation of my, of my work on tabletop gaming, um, uh, which then made a bunch of people grumpy. Um, there's, a, there's a right wing um, blogger, uh, Michelle Malkin, and she also made a video uh, about me, and so I got a bunch of like YouTube comments on a, on a video, and that was maybe exciting, but not not very exciting. Um, and so I was trying to, I was thinking through this. I was like, that's an interesting way to come back from like a big academic conference where it's been like like pretty boring talk. Right? And the talk is about this paper in Mind Culture and Activity that looks at. Uh, to be fair, so the, the Breitbart headline is Stanford Professor Dungeons and Dragons Perpetuate Systems of White Male Privilege. They kind of got it right. Like it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of what the work says. Um, it's behind the table, so a bunch of them are really grumpy. Um, the paper essentially looked at, I, I looked at, uh, they say they're on the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there are 12 editions of it, so I read all of the rule books of the 12 editions. I looked at pronoun use. I, I counted pictures. It's so like in the first edition, uh, these are two of the four pictures of women in that book. Uh, and so I counted, right, without putting values on the kinds we can think about representation looks like, I'm just counting um, the number of pictures uh, of, that include women in them uh, and the percentages. Uh, I would just look across all of the books, right? And I also look at, I did the same thing with race as well. Uh, I can, race and images is a much more complicated thing, so instead I looked at the ways that race as a marker was represented within the text. Uh, so things like you can play a character like a half-orc, uh, and the language of what it means to be a half-orc means that, uh, this is directly from the most recent rule book, each half-orc finds a way to gain acceptance from those who hate orcs, so there's these implicit values within a particular kind of meaning of what race means within the system. Uh, and so as I thought about representations of gender, I thought about representations of race, I was reminded that uh, as a tabletop role-playing game, uh, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, the folks in the center, uh, are the, they were war gaming aficionados who created this tabletop game, right? It was essentially white boys with toys, right? Who, uh, who then made this fantasy game, right? Like that's, that's, those are the origins of where this game came from. Uh, and it came from a very particular kind of white male gaze that shaped the values of uh, the first role-playing game, right? So this idea of a role-playing game, uh, the reason the word role-playing game exists uh, is because back then all these other companies saw that Dungeons and Dragons were selling to a bunch of nerds and they also wanted to make money off of it. But you can't say, here's a game that's like Dungeons and Dragons because they'd sue you. Uh, so they created, they created this title, role-playing game. So you could say, here's a role-playing game, which then meant like Dungeons and Dragons, so they can't get sued. So this was the first role-playing game uh, and created that title. The whole reason I did this work was I'd done a bunch of stuff around gaming and classrooms, and the literature review and educational research around gaming is tied to video games. Uh, and at the time that I was doing this work, uh, the video game industry continues to go through this thing called Gamergate, right? which is essentially a concerted effort to suppress and cause violence towards women, towards the LGBTQ community within the gaming, gaming culture. Right? And so I really struggled with, it's easy to be anonymous and a jerk in online spaces, um, it's harder to do that when you sit at a table with people and play a game where you have to sit at a table and make eye contact with folks. Uh, so those were the roots of why I studied Dungeons and Dragons. And then it came kind of full circle to uh, this headline, right, of uh, this is why I did the work, right, it was like this kind of out of <laughs> form. Uh, and so I thought about like the historical parallels of how this work happened, right? So this was the tension that I was thinking about in terms of the audience that I was trying to study and the environment I was trying to study in also kind of came full circle and really challenged my own assumptions about how and why we do this work in uh, digital and analog have the same kinds of uh, sociocultural tensions tied to them. So the question that I want us to be thinking about, again, this would be a great place to pause, but we're not going to, uh, is what legacies, values, and beliefs are implicit or tacit in how our research is undertaken? Uh, I added more questions to this um, so that folks could think about these, um, but who are you writing with or for or about in your work? Uh, 
what do you speak toward or away from, what labels are applied or assumed in the work that you're doing, and how are humans, how are individuals, how are bodies of people accounted for within the work that you're doing, right? Recognizing that we might be coming from a very different kind of set of methodological values, a different kind of set of assumptions about what schooling and research looks like, uh, or maybe not schooling at all, that might not be a domain that you're interested in. Where are the people in the work that you're doing and how are they counted for in that work? Okay, last one. Uh, researcher and identity. Prince Rogers Nelson was 26 the year that Purple Rain was released. He was already a seasoned veteran in the recording industry with five prior hit albums and Prince's blend of savvy showmanship and confrontational sexuality and unconventional music musicality presented an artist that remained at the center of how music was heard, performed, and understood internationally for nearly four decades. Prince's music frequently embraced questions about his identity. The Taylor song off of 1981's Controversy centers how Prince's identity does and does not play into the expectations of a consuming audience questioning, am I black or white, am I straight or gay, that sort of thing. For the past few years, the, an emerging line of my writing and research has been focusing on healing and on the healing and caring needs in classrooms, particularly since the 2016 US presidential election. I've been articulating this political event as one that illuminates how the affective dimensions in classrooms, how students and teachers heal, are intentionally tied to the political. The election was and remains a traumatic event that, was harmed, that has harmed students and teachers alike, and has continued to illuminate a general blind spot in terms of how we prepare teachers, not only to support the healing needs of students, but to also move beyond the whitewashed mantras of self-care and mindfulness to more fully heal and be whole in our own classrooms. This is my friend, Mark. Uh, Mark and I uh, opened a school together, the Critical Design and Gaming School at Grand River High School uh, in Los Angeles. He's been a thinking partner. He would say he's my nemesis, that's also true. Uh, we went through our teacher education program together, through our teachers together. Um, and at the year that we were doing some work together, uh, he was also, he called himself the New Age Dean, but it basically meant that he worked with the most at-risk students at his school in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and in, in that year, there was a heightened gun violence that was happening. Um, and he, he lost three different students over the course of one academic year. And it's not just him, right? He, <coughs> that community, lost three different students over the course of that year. Uh, and so I, I checked in with Mark, right? Um, and he, he would text me, right? I'm tired, super tired. Um, and I thought about this, right? Because Mark is dealing both with supporting the students and the teachers, right? And he's working closely with these students that, that we lost. Um, and then the, the school year, or the school day would end, and he would get in his car and drive 10 minutes away uh, and be a dad for three for two kids with a third on the way at the time um, and, and kind of have to make this transition and not be this morning grieving person and be somebody else entirely. So Mark lives two lives as he daily discards the vagaries of localized violence and racial injustice in order to be a present and welcoming father to his children when come home, coming home each day. In these Clark Kent-like transformations from one person to another, what is lost in the transition? And excluding our fullest selves and being present in classrooms, not only do we offer a hypocritical lesson for students about exuding one's own humanity and vulnerability in society, and perhaps reinforcing unwelcomed assumptions about masculinity in the process, we also make it impossible to personally experience transformation through the interactions we have with our students. When I think about the ways I've been exploring, questioning, and healing my way through questions of care in classrooms and in the lives of teachers, I'm reminded of the care needs I had when, now nearly a decade and a half later, my father passed away during my second year as a teacher. Despite substantial preparation and support for the demanding needs of classroom teaching, I was unprepared for the tidal-like tidal wave, tidal wave-like whoosh of grief that flooded my instincts on how to share my full humanity as a teacher and colleague in my school. I grow with and through these feelings and I want to acknowledge my dad as a source of reflection in the present vitriolic moment of politicized care. What compels a researcher towards a certain question or a certain kind of question? Through what lens is such a question viewed, molded, reshaped? Reconciling why certain questions attract one's gaze as a researcher and what values, assumptions, and beliefs are imbued in this attraction are crucial, particularly considering the sociopolitical world in which a simple statement of Black Lives Matter must be voiced and intentionally repeated, questioning why certain research questions are asked and by whom is a necessary act. The electric word life is one that lasts a mighty long time, 
positionality is not something that is supposed to get out of the way. Rather, it's an ongoing, it is ongoing and it is fluid. Change across time is natural. Uh, the Politics of Learning Writing Collective in the 2017 Cognition Instruction Essay noted, we need to develop multiple spaces, methods, theories, and tools to critically examine power and politics and learning. I'm reflecting on these layers of research uh, in this particular moment of urgency. Uh, further, platforms, environments, and positionality in various contexts have already been taken up. None of these are new. I don't, I don't think I've invented, I don't think we've talked about positionality. It's just, it's not the new thing. But I do want to make clear uh, that these are inherently intertwined in our work, and, we must, and they must be named and unpacked and continually revisited. Our work is not separated from the platforms on which it is taken up, nor from the pools of culture and politics in which it is immersed, nor the bodies through which we as researchers sense and feel knowledge around us. And again, I say this in the present and urgent, right, decisive moment. We're sitting in a top tier university with all of the resources and with all of the resources and all of the privilege, right? We have everything here, right? We've got everything. Uh, we are in a position to substantially address the immediate needs for healing, reconciliation, resistance, and social transformation. Ours are tools for reimagining and reinterpreting how the world around us is enacted and shaped, particularly as historic systemic features of a current era of nationalism, oppression, and violence shapes the lives of individuals today. These layers must work synergistically towards the methodological clarity in our field. Our methods must hew towards an ethos of dignity and attempt to articulate the humanity shaped an environment often rife with historic racism, sexism, ableism, heterosexism, and other intersecting forms of oppression. And yet, we must also recognize that simply acknowledging the harm being done uh, in schools, in our community, and in our own lives is not enough. For the past two and a half years, I keep thinking about Philando Castile's mother's comments in an interview reflecting on the death of her son, <coughs> killed by a police officer while sitting in his car on July 6, 2016 one day after the similar ghastly death of Pauline Sterling. She says, that was something we always discussed, comply. Whatever they ask you to do, do it. Don't say nothing, just do whatever they want you to do. So what's the difference in complying when you get killed anyway? Her comments are a reminder that we read, write, and teach within systems designed to reinforce colonial violence. The ways we engage in this work, the communities we may be immersed in, and the platforms on which we study and interact, all of these are often stained by harm, by pain, and by acts of subjugation. And yet these histories too shine brightly with the possibility of radical transformation of what Adrienne Marie Brown in her Afrofuturist, Afrofuturist Guidebook for Activism and Change calls an emergent strategy. And so I return to the questions that opened uh, these comments. Uh, what is left unexplored vis-a-vis -vis our current methodological practices? What kinds of knowledge from our past work must we reinterrogate? And what's it all for? Why are we here? Who benefits? What kinds of questions uh, for the students here? What kinds of questions uh, as a dissertation tackling, right? Uh, as not the advisor for most of you in the room, right? <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to be thinking about, are you asking big questions that are consequential, even if they drive your advisor nuts, right? Um, or are you asking the questions that'll get the paper signed so you can be done, right? Like what kinds of impacts are we making you're here in a way that a lot of money is being invested in you. You get to be selfish in this space and in this time. Uh, it's a hell of a thing to think about the privilege, nepotism, back padding, as well as honest to God, intellectual elbow grease that allows us to be in this room together right now, doing nothing else but think, think deeply, but simply think about the problems of educational equity in the world today. With this privilege, there's an unbelievable amount of capital that flows through a campus like ours to make such a deep, well-intentioned thinking possible. We think as the bodies of young people we are working to support are held in cages. We think and we write up literature reviews and submit articles for interminable months only to deign to receive or revise and resubmit, <laughs> while the rights of women to make decisions about their bodies continue to be restricted daily. Uh, for the students here, uh, for five or six or seven or eight or nine years, uh, regardless of the age <laughs> and domains of the learners you're studying, consider how many waves of individuals flow, flow through the systems of learning while you're here. Dreams live and die in classrooms every day, and I get to ramble about prints with all of you, right? And you think about what does this mean? Uh, so for all of us, what is the sum knowledge of lives that will feel tangibly different from the knowledge we share, the ideas we sit with, or that we think deeply about, and the actions that we take? We're reminded that things are much harder in the afterworld, and we carry with us the electric word life that means forever and is a mighty long time. 
So we've 30, that's 35 minutes, I was close. Uh, so I've got, I'm gonna put this slide back up because this is what I was hoping we'd spend time thinking about. Um, so I can pause and, and I don't think there's a lot, of, it's kind of a down over top, sorry. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm also hoping this could be a place where people could either think out loud or think to yourself around what this might mean for your own work or if you have examples of places that you're being pushed on and thinking about. Also, it's tenth week, right? I get it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you for sharing. That was exciting to to accompany you on. Um, and I'm curious if you could uh, say a little bit more about the <clears throat> the metronome point mm -hmm. and the sort of the spaces in between, yeah. and and how that relates to platform and resolution. I mean, for sure, like with regards to the the MP3 stuff. Mm -hmm. it, was, I, it was clear, but with, with regard to like the yeah. yeah. So, so the reason I got to the I'll talk about how the metronome and the stopwatch relate to my work in particular, and then hopefully broaden out in a second. Um, so I talk about the gaming research and how I end up finding tabletop games, and part of that is this limitation of when we talk about games and learning, most of the time we talk about video games and learning, uh, and so there's this thing where you haven't reconciled what does games and learning actually mean because we're usually talking about digital and learning and games and learning. We haven't separated these pieces out, right? And so I wanted to recognize that there's affordances that are tied to digital, there's affordances that are tied to gaming, and we, we kind of squash these together within this particular segment of educational research. So this is one piece for me to think about. So I've been pushing in the literacies world to say, when you talk about analog literacies, we always talk about digital literacies as this sexy thing that NSF will find or something. Um, but, but what about the analog literacies that we live and breathe in every day? Because when we talk about digital, right, the word digital, so separate aside from technology, is about these discrete differences, right? You're on or off. It's a, there's binary steps of like incremental steps. And you can make those really, really precise, but there's no smaller, I don't know how a stopwatch works, right? But there's no smaller number over here. Like there's no like 5.3, right? It's impossible for that to work. So at some point, there's a limiting factor in our games with digital tools, right? When we think about those affordances, when we think about the analog, the analog, in my opinion, accompanying, accom encompasses everything, right? All of the work we should do should think about the ways we interact humanly and what might not be common, right? I might want to be able to make some gestures. I was just reading some work uh, in the in the Twitch world of video game live streaming esports uh, <laughs> of um, the ways that uh, racist comments emerge in Twitch streams. As people are playing, um, and one way that happens is there's only two emotes that show black people in them, right? Like little icons, emojis. Uh, and so anytime someone says something that is tied to black culture, people just fill the chat with these two emotes, right? In ways that signal blackness, we're talking about something black in a very racist way, right? And we think about like, these are digital limitations. We can imagine who probably designed those tools and why that happened, right? Um, and what would it mean to think about how talk would have been different in an analog setting to think about the parallels with the digital? So my bias is thinking about digital technology around these. I think the metronome for me is a push on thinking about how are we, like what is the, what are the limitations with the tools that we have and how we think about the work we're doing. Does that make sense, Jonathan? Yeah. Yeah. I had a question, I wonder if you could go to the slide about your study in the 2016 Midwest High School. Yes. Um, uh, this one? No. Um, like the, the, the chart that showed the yeah, so what I'm kind of interested in having you talk about is this first row of feelings that technology is invisible mm -hmm. that the students talked about. And I'm wondering with like the rise of nationalism and the use of like digital spaces like Twitter yeah. Yeah. To, um, to convey, you know, systematic violence, yeah. oppression, incivility, whatever yeah. you name, whether or not you're seeing in your work that technology is continuing to stay invisible considering the rhetoric yeah. that is conveyed through that platform which to me seems now really visible and uplifted because yeah. of the vastness of it yeah it's uh, and there's been some really interesting pushes in i mean just in the last day in twitter and in youtube right in terms yeah. of uh who are they banning who are they demonetizing right those all tied to digital um, 
So a little bit more exam uh, context for this work. Uh, this is a, a smaller study of um, a bunch of classrooms that are doing ninth grade project-based learning in English classrooms. Uh, and one of the projects in this project-based learning curriculum, um, the titles changed, but at the time was called the singularity. And it was this idea that someday, do people know the singularity idea? Uh, Ray Kurzweil, who I think still works at Google maybe, uh, came up with this idea that someday our technology uh, will build up a consciousness, right? And, our, and like te technology will, will emerge as a singularity of all, all technology will kind of converge and scary and dystopic ways. Uh, and so we built around that and said, okay, technology's taken over and ro the robots have won was the, the premise for the project. Uh, and now we're building a museum to preserve what humanity needs. We're gonna explore technology right now for the future, right? So in doing that, uh, these teachers did projects that were six to eight weeks long. Um, where they're investigating things like robots and AI, right? So this kind of stuff. Uh, and during that time, um, the graduate students and I were in these classrooms and looking at how were teachers talking? How were students talking? And what kind of tools did they use, right? There wasn't anything fancy. They didn't ever go on Twitter, for example, right? They mainly used things like Google Classroom, um, Quizlet, or um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the quiz game? Kahoot. Kahoot, thank you, yeah. yeah. Kahoot, they use Kahoot, they love Kahoot. Um, so like all the kind of typical ed tech stuff that we think Ed Moto and stuff that's it's fine. Larry probably has better feelings about all of this than I do. Uh, it does what it's supposed to do in ways that aren't very interesting to me. Um, but the talk around it I thought was interesting, right? In that um, this all happened uh, in the months before the election, right? So at the same time that all these students were talking about this stuff, we passed Trump signs, right? This is like a very this was a swing state. Uh, we passed fewer Clinton signs. Um, this is an open carry state. We saw people like carry guns around publicly. And so we think about the ways that they talked about technology. They created apps to kill ISIS as like one example of the kinds of things that students were talking about. Um, but the politicized stuff was oftentimes taken as invisible, right? Uh, but the other thing that was taken as invisible in this example was students would say things like, technology is not very important for me, like, like this kid, right? Um, but he'd say that while he's playing like the snake game on his phone, right? Um, <laughs> Or, or they'd say that while they're playing YouTube videos of their favorite songs that they want. So they'd be doing really digitally rich stuff, but didn't count as technology. Same, they'd also, like, old kinds of technology wouldn't count either, right? So one thing, I, one of the teachers I really liked, she would, I liked all the teachers, but one of the teachers, <laughs> one of the ingenious moves of one teacher was she would take dry erase markers and students would use their desks as whiteboards, right? And they would just write on them. Like, that's the coolest technology ever, right? That's great. Uh, and they, but, Neither the kids nor the teachers saw that as technology, right? So this meaning of technology is always something that's in the future, right? It's always something that's unattainable. When we think about technology, it's over there. It's never, the, this isn't technology when you always have it. This isn't technology when you always have it. Uh, and so this is where that invisible piece came from. What, what isn't in the study, though, is the ways that digital tools were used for politicized talk, right? This came up with a new cohort of teachers doing this work uh, uh, in Michigan where they're looking, so one of the projects uh, the students are doing stuff around police brutality and police violence. They created hashtags. They're trying to get some more engagement there, um, but it wasn't it wasn't accounted for here. Mm -hmm. right. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daphne. Yeah. I think um, as a first year student and with this little community of students here, um, the concern of not being examined and not falling into kind of the pits and the questions. That, so what? To not do damage? To, <laughs> how, to hold those things, how to hold, like, how, how to proceed, especially, and I don't know if it's particular here, but with all of the resources here, to hold true to, like, the values that either we came in with or that we're like, oh, this is a value, mm -hmm. because it feels like, it definitely feels like we're swimming in midstream, no matter what, if, if you have any suggestions for those. I'd be curious if other people have suggestions, too. There's a, there's a there's a 1200 page novel called The Instructions uh, by this guy Adam Levin, who's not the Maroon 5 singer, um, about a 10 year old boy who thinks he's the Messiah. Uh, has anyone read this book? It's really good. Have you, did you like the book? It's not, it's fine. It's funny yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a key refrain that shows up in this book uh, by this 10 year old kid who thinks he's the Messiah. Um, that there's always damage, right? It's kind of this inevitability that, like, yeah. and, and so, so you don't have to read that book now. Yeah. 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 I'm afraid you're going to say 
Yeah. No, don't, don't it. It's not in the instructions. Um, but I think I, one thing to think about is if, we're, if, if your context, for example, is US schooling, right? Uh, we follow this back to the foundations of the United States and the Constitution, and that is tied to capital as tied to the bodies of black people, right? Like we think about the slave trade as built into or not into the, the, the Constitution. Daniel Allen has a different take on that interpretation. Um, but if that's the case, if we're trying to improve school, we need to recognize that school is always inherently inequitable, unless it's about some kind of radical other, right? This other kind of possibility in the ways that uh, someone like Megan Bang and the Learning Challenge Coalition has been thinking about. Um, or I think, um, I've been thinking a lot about this from the Afro's Futurist Lens, because I think they're much more about taking the political present and imagining something other than what's now, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the ways we think about that damage is to, to acknowledge the kind of damage that already exists and thinking about, do we add to that, right, with the work we're doing? I, 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 we don't take a Hippocratic oath, which is probably a problem as, as educators and as researchers. Um, but, but tied to that, so thinking about like what kinds of commitments do we have, right? And how do we measure what is good, right? If, if those measures are tied to particular kinds of academic learning outcomes, those might actually be causing harm at the same time, but uh, our measures might not be telling for that too. It's not a good answer, but maybe someone else can, can fix that. Does anyone else have a good answer? Right. I, can't, I can't fix it. Um, but I want to challenge the Hippocratic Oath talk. Yeah. In that I think you're absolutely right in our casual language and therefore the way we do our work. If I actually think carefully about the CITI training that we need mm -hmm. in order to get institutional true, yeah. approval, there are some really solid principles that would align with a mm -hmm. researcher um, uh, Hippocratic Oath. I can tell you I've had several conversations with colleagues and doc students about how quickly we, they, us, have gotten through the training, yep. or my renewal, or let's get it done and submit our IRB. That's a place within the system yeah. we actually could push on ourselves and take that those ideas more seriously. That's really helpful. Yeah, I think I might have maybe even to Stephanie described that training as like like online driver's ed. Yeah. You know, that yeah. Yeah. I'm guilty of it too. It's really not until you made that comment that yeah. I paused to think about it. Yeah, that's a, that's a helpful place to yeah, fix it too. Other, can other people fix this? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want to throw it back, particularly to the first years, because you have more power at your disposal than you realize because you're not steeped yet in the system. Where you, you reach the end of your one, minus finals week, etc. Where do you see the little spaces that you could do less harm? I feel like I'm struggling with feeling like the whole system needs to be restored and started over. And so any tweak to a bad system. tweaking a bad system. And so it feels weird to be like, oh great, I'm studying desegregation and I'm gonna make this little road, or this little journey in this one classroom, maybe I'll be able to make it better for these three kids. I'm like, wow, that feels like useless. As much as I love children and these three kids, like that matters to me, but like, wow, am I really just tweaking or are you removing what you're doing a very good job of spiritual teaching the kids to bring them all home? We probably get second year too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, I have a different question, but good. I don't want to move the conversation on. Really? All right, so this is a little selfish one, but but um, I kept thinking with the um, with the MP3 stuff. Uh, I was listening to the author of that book talk about that book last night. Oh really? YouTube. Yeah. Oh um, okay. it wasn't here. Okay. No, not here, not here. But on YouTube, I was watching YouTube. So you can check that out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but one thing he said that struck me, I think, is that he was framing like MP3s and records as being unified through the concept of confession. Mm -hmm. And I, and I kept thinking of like confession and confessions like, you know, things that are high get brought down a little, things that are low get brought up, and you sort of lose and gain something through that process. Yeah. 
no matter what, whether it's analog or digital. And I'm curious, like, I kept trying to, I, I kept trying to like not be distracted by that too much during your talk, but it was distracting. But like, how, how, how could you see like the notion of compression as like relating to some of these things about an audience and like? It's a real niche question. Or, <laughs> it's interesting that one person came up. But so, <laughs> I, 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 there, there was a quote that I pulled out of here for because it's already droning on and on. Um, from uh, from not a sound person, but Virginia Heffernan, who's been like she has a book called The Internet Is Magic, I think. Um, and there's a quote where she talks about the need for uncompressed social air. Uh, and I really like that framing of uh, being back to the analog, right? So if digital is about compressing and it's for space limitations, right, as a human. It's about, I think it's about capturing particular amounts of information in short spaces. Um, <clears throat> what's that mean uh, when things are uncompressed in an analog setting, right? So coming back to this digital analog space, at least for me, uh, I'd also say compression is about squeezing things in school is a particular kind of compression <laughs> towards a particular kind of orientation, right? Uh, if you're compressed in different ways or uncompressed in different kinds of ways, what's that mean, right? I think there's, um, that might be an orientation. I don't know. I don't know if it's a good question. Or not. Okay. Are you, about, you have sound compression ideas? Uh, lots of them. We can talk about afterwards. Uh, but really, that's about the military. So the first sort of attempts to compress Sound had to do with uh, telephone wires because the wire wires have physical properties. They only have so much. Um, they can only carry so much information, as it were. And early in the day, early in telephone development, telephones, that was the big question: was how to make the um, the resolution better, right? Because it always sounded horrible on the other end. And so the military came in and figured out ways to have better compression, right? Have, have uh, greater fidelity with more compression. And it's an interesting case. Takes that waveform and it lops off the top end and lops off the bottom end, so you're left with the stingy little middle, but you lose the high and low and audio file that you brought about here. <laughs> More than they should, but yep. it's about it's about <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a kind of um, signal and noise. Yeah, but tied to the army is a useful tied to the military. Yeah. Always tied to the military. Rough. Yeah, and I thought it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you all for, I'm really great. I'm, I'm here for a couple more minutes, so I'm happy to uh, answer other things. But thanks to answer. Thanks for letting me talk again. Thank you.